All right, welcome everybody. This is the Kafu the Geek Show. That is the first episode of 2021. And for this first episode, I really wanted to dig deep with a veteran teacher that's in the in the trenches, so to speak, that's uh, probably been working through what's, we're almost coming up on a year of a pandemic. So with me is Alicia Blankenship, and she is from Morton Ranch High School in the Katy uh, ISD in near Houston, Texas, I believe. Hope that's the case. And right. Alicia, thank you so much. And like most of my guests, I kind of meet everybody through uh, seeing Twitter and I look for interesting people and comments. And so you have come up on my my Twitter list and feed as a person who's posting interesting things. And actually I wanna talk uh, about one of your posts that was recent that I thought was really good and you got some good conversation. So I'll spring that question on you in a little bit. But let's um, let's start off, first of all, thank you for joining me. This is again, my first interview of the new year. And uh, tell me about your educational journey, if you wouldn't mind, tell me, uh, really just from the start, how did you get to be an educator? Who inspired you? Who influenced you? Uh, tell us your college, college's ex experience and so on and so forth. Okay, sure. Um, actually, my father um, got transferred from Memphis, Tennessee to Houston when I was in the second grade. So we um, moved up, moved and packed up and uh, came to Houston, which was a shocking experience. Um, I went from a pretty much all black school to um, an integrated school, um, which was really something. Not that there wasn't integration in, in Memphis, but uh, it's just the nature of where we were um, ethnographically speaking. So um, there were a lot of cultural things I had to learn there. Um, it was difficult <laughs> because that was the 80s. And um, I'll say that people weren't uh, super um, happy about uh, being diverse. Uh, but I found a really amazing teacher there at that school. It was Brill Elementary. And um, the lady's name was Sherry Mays. Sherry Mays was my third grade teacher. And I, I guess what she did was gave me acknowledgement. And that was what I needed at the time. So um, I've always liked school. And, um, and school was always easy for me, even though we went to many, many different schools because we moved in a lot of different places. A lot of people aren't aware that Houston is, is ginormous. And um, because of that, uh, the stretch of uh, the breadth of it, um, there's, a, there's a lot of space. And so it took a while before um, my family decided the prefer preferred area where they wanted to live. So then after we ended up um, uh, out in Katy, I spent most of my middle school, junior high, high, um, high school years there. Um, and that's where I currently am. So um, in Katy, um, I went to high school out there. It's really something to um, live and work in the same area um, where you grew up. And I actually um, went to Houston Community College before I went to uh, University of Houston. And as I was working, I worked at Kinko's at the time. I'm not sure if you guys know about Kinko's. That was, we that was do. a throwback. We do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kinko's, I was a, a copy person. You know, I used to uh, take orders for copies. And there was a lady who came across who worked at Houston Community College. And she uh, was a grant coordinator. And she said that she had free schooling for people who wanted to be teachers. And I was like, wow, that's me. So um, I ended up uh, taking her order for that grant and keeping one of those flyers. And I applied and I got it. So I got a chance to have uh, free tuition, free books, and a stipend for my first two years of school at the community college. And then it was a two plus two program. It was supposed to have transferred to University of St. Thomas, but it didn't. Um, the funding got cut and I ended up uh, going to University of Houston, which was fine. It's a wonderful university and I was so happy to be there. And um, what's funny about that is, is that years later, University of St. Thomas had a grant that came across my email and said, hey, if you would like to work with special ed and bilingual students and become a leader in research regarding that, 
you know, apply for this grant. And I did. And so um, that's how I got my uh, master's degree from University of St. Thomas for free. Who are some of your inspirations? I would say I've had a, a lot of inspirations along the way. Um, you know, my family's been a big uh, influencer over my education, um, uh, not to mention just curiosity. You know, um, education is empowering and it's necessary in order to find success. And I guess that's what been the driving force behind all the things I've wanted to know. Um, I would say my dad always influenced me to read any book I wanted to read. And um, I lived at the library uh, growing up. Uh, Sherry Mays, that teacher in elementary, really um, had a big impression on me. And um, I spoke to her just like four years ago, uh, found her on Facebook, which was really neat. Um, also, I've had a lot of um, influential um, professors, for example, Dr. Montoyo Harmon. I saw her when I was just a student teacher, but her research about um, language registers and how they affect uh, bilingual students was uh, pivotal for me at that time um, and, and changed my impression of how you build an, a second language or um, an additional language for someone. Um, I, at University of Houston, I got a chance to take a class with Kylene Beers, and if you're in the English world, you know she is a rock star, and um, that was epic, and so um, she definitely, um, you know, just sprinkled all her magic, and, and that really, that class really influenced me a lot um, in my career as an English teacher, a literacy teacher. So let's talk about uh, the pandemic. Here we are, I'm sitting in my home and worrying about dogs and <laughs> barking and that sort of thing. And, and here you are in your car. We've, we've certainly had to adjust through uh, a pretty challenging time, but let's, let's be kind of region specific. How has Texas and how have you uh, in your school kind of balanced um, all the concerns of the pandemic with trying to still provide uh, the best education you can for your students? Well, I'd like to first say that, you know, Texas is very big. So I can literally drive for 10 hours and still be in Texas, you know? And because the state is so large, then each community has had to evaluate how they want to, you know, take care of it, depending on their population, um, demographics, and, and all of those things. But in my particular area, greater Houston area is really, Houston is the central city, but there are many connecting communities that we all consider just Houston, even though they might have their own mayor and such. In our particular region, uh, we decided to go back to school. So we've been face-to-face um, -face classes since August. Um, parents had the opportunities to decide uh, whether their child would be at home or face to face. And as I understand in our area, there are some districts who um, have let that be rolling. So every six weeks, um, the parent can decide. In some places they had to make a decision and, and, and keep it that way for the semester. So we've been in blended classes, face to face classes. Um, some people have only virtual classes and um, students separately. Some of us have it blended where you've got students in a classroom and students online simultaneously. So um, that's more of, of my situation. So the majority of my classes, I'm teaching only students in my room, but for three of those classes, um, I, they are considered blended where I teach students online and students in my room. So one of the one of your posts, I believe, on Twitter said, I love research. Is that true? And what are some of the research trends you like following as a teacher? And I think I think it's really important. And, and I come from, you know, a father who was a doctor and my mother was a nurse. And so there was that constant, you know, reading of the research for new techniques, new ideas. I mean, it was it took that was a big part of their day. Um, do you feel, I guess this is a bigger question, I suppose, but as educators, do you think we're as up to date on research as we should be? 
and again, come back down to it to just your personal level. What kind of research do you like reading about and what's what's important and what are some trends you're seeing? So I know that's, I kind of made that a bigger question and it probably started out. To <laughs> well, I think that in general, um, my perspective on research is that of action research actually. So um, through my graduate um, degree, um, our master thesis was action research. That was what we were um, asked to do. And so um, being the researcher is really what I think teachers should be doing. We are the ones in the classroom. We have our unique situations. And even though action research could be um, approachable through my own demographic and maybe someone else's demographic is different, it would give a starting or jumping off point for teachers. I think um, as teachers, you know, in general, we are very polite where we are looking for someone else to do the research in our areas. And I think we should be the leaders in those areas. The problem is the funding and the problem is the red tape. So many districts don't want to allow teachers to conduct the research that they would like to do, even though it's not going to compromise uh, the education of the students in a poor way. So um, I think teachers are, should be the ones uh, leading that particular research. And that's kind of what I was trying to inspire on that particular post. You know, have teachers ask the questions, what is it that you've always wanted to know? Because they are going to be the ones who are gonna be leading the students and, uh, and causing the changes. Um, the particular research that I did um, back at, um, in graduate school was conducting research about um, reciprocal uh, reading comprehension techniques and seeing if it's really effective with students who have uh, learning disabilities and, um, and or um, a second language acquisition. So I wanted to know, would it work? Will it work for these kids? You know, because a lot of the kids in the control groups were, you know, monolingual um, and to see how that would open up. And it was effective. And um, and what that did was it made me use that particular technique throughout my teaching now. So um, my interest in, in literacy or research in general is um, is helping to influence uh, students so that they don't struggle. You know, if I get a student um, at the high school level whose um, lexile or the reading level, let's say, is close to second or third grade, um, I think that's a very tragic thing. And um, I think that's happening across the, across the country because we've had some um, differences in whether this technique or this technique or how they blend together and all of these things. And that's uh, really caused a lot of confusion and a lot of problems. So I would like to take the point of learning to where it's not successful and see which uh, ways there are to adapt um, in order to help the individual student. A lot of times I think schools are, are plugged into programming because uh, the districts or the areas are trying to be consistent, but um, I think that sometimes that leads to non-responsiveness uh, on the part of the educator. And I'm hoping that we can influence a change with that. Um, I went to New Zealand uh, on a Fund for Teachers grant and I got a chance to, uh, to speak with Carla McNeil who was talking about alphabetic uh, research, I mean, alphabetic principle and, and research regarding, um, you know, basically teaching an alphabetic code in order to help people with reading disabilities. And, you know, that, uh, that pivot, that, that uh, research has pivoted because it used to be, you know, whole language versus phonics and all of these things. Of course, the research has been coming out, which is good. And that's what we need. We need to know what really works. And, um, through that particular fund for teachers grant that I tried to get, uh, which I did. Um, I also got a chance to go to California and I went to a neuroscience and education conference where I learned about how your brain works. And um, Dr. Julie Willis got a chance to um, explain which techniques work and why. And I think as educators, we need to get more on that sense of understanding why it works so we can reproduce it. I loved that answer. And again, I was thinking of it from, you know, 
teachers should read more research. But what you said about action research, I think is so powerful because it it brings exactly what I, I, I wanted when I, again, asked to speak with you is that that first person experience that we're, I think we're missing in education. And, you know, I, I recently wrote a blog post um, called Death by Acronym, which is about, you know, how we rely on state education, we rely on the federal government to, to come up with all of these magical buzzwords and acronyms that after a while, we don't even know what they mean anymore, right? And um, and if we could bring it back down to that level of teacher as researcher, as action, as action researcher, wow, I, I think, I, th I think that's really amazing. And I think we need to get back to that philosophy. So uh, I'm, I'm really blown away by that answer. Um, so thank you for that. You, you really, I think I'm going to have to, <laughs> we, we might need to start, start a new <laughs> educational movement <laughs> for action research. And, and again, maybe it's out there and I'm, I'm just missing it. Maybe it's just my, uh, you know, maybe I've got blinders on and it's not there, but I really, I really think that's so important. So thank you. Thank you. Um, part of your work is with literacy. And I, you know, I worry one of the big, I think, challenges of this pandemic is is keeping kids reading and I, I so worry about that again because of a lot of different factors kids aren't having the support at home uh you know having access to good books and reading materials I, I, that that to me gives me kind of uh, nightmares um what are your thoughts on literacy and literacy and education and and what are ways we can improve it as teachers well it could be somewhat of a controversial answer. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> let me explain. Uh, I started out teaching elementary. So um, I began my career as an elementary teacher. I taught second grade. And um, after teaching second grade, then I moved to teaching ESL. So I was an uh, English as a second language teacher teaching English uh, for students who um, had uh, were newcomers to the country. Okay. Um, during that focus, um, you know, it, it becomes clear what understanding the language can do. You know, if you don't understand the language well, it's a huge barrier. It's a huge barrier for your success. And um, it doesn't have to be for everyone. I'm not making, you know, blanket, you know, remarks there are people who do well and, and that kind of thing. But for the majority of us, uh, if we don't have a command of literacy, knowing how to read well, uh, knowing how to write well, then um, life can be really difficult. And so um, my, after I uh, got my graduate degree, then I became a special ed teacher. So uh, I'm a special education English teacher. And I say that's different um, uh, than a regular English teacher because English teachers in general, especially in the secondary level, are focusing largely on literature. Okay. But um, my father is an engineer. And um, he will tell you, um, you know, probably reluctantly, that he's never read an entire novel ever because uh, he doesn't find them interesting and he didn't like them. He used to read comics and he likes to read information books. And that's what he likes. He used to read the Cliff Notes version of the literature, um, of all the books that he had to for high school. And, um, and that's how he got through. So I, I want to make the distinction because I think there should be a shift, um, which I said that is a little bit controversial. Um, there should be a shift and, um, and how we teach English currently, not to say that learning, um, you know, British lit and world lit is not important. I think it is, but I think when they, when we have so many students who aren't reading and writing well, then we have mixed our focus and that we need to focus on those preliminary skills. And for the kids who would like to learn more literature, then I say push that as an elective course um, and work more towards um, actual reading and writing tasks. Um, as a 
you know, secondary offering, I do uh, tutorials for students trying to write um, letters to colleges, trying to, you know, get entrance into college education and all those things. And even in the very best schools, some of those letters are very bad. They're very bad. They're, their essays are very bad. They're poorly written. And, um, and, I, and that lets you know that throughout many different areas that um, something is not working. Something is not working properly where a student can't write um, an essay expressing him or herself in a way that where they're easily understood. <clears throat> So um, what I hope for is that, uh, that students can be empowered with reading well um, at any level. Now, of course, um, right now um, where I teach, I teach students in special education. So the key to teaching special education resource students, that means students who are more than two or three years off grade level is, um, having passion and being on fire you've got to burn hot to catch kids on fire who have felt rejected by education in general they feel like uh, teachers have promised year after year that they're going to learn how to read and then they never did they never learned they never got better they never learned the keys and i think that it's not that the teachers don't want to teach them i think they do i just don't think they know how um People always talk about that shift in elementary from, you know, reading to learn, I mean, learning to read to reading to learn, and that does happen. And the problem is that maybe that we push them too quickly to where they haven't learned those basics, and then they never do. So, um, you know, then they're just listening to stories and answering reading comprehension questions, which doesn't do any uh, favors for their actual reading process. That's what they need to learn. Um, I think I answered the question. I, I might have gone <laughs> off on a tangent. No, that was great. That was great. <laughs> Tangents are good. But no, I think I, I, I think what I, if I were to consolidate what you said is we really need to kind of reach students in a variety of forms uh, for reading. And we have a lot of variety. Again, you can talk about reading comic books or informational pieces. Uh, and let me just tie into that because I'm a, I'm, I'm a ed tech nerd at heart. Do you think technology is helping, mm -hmm. hurting, or does it really matter on how we harness it? Hmm. Um, I think technology is very helpful to students trying to navigate um, secondary school. Uh, for example, there's a co-writer. Co-writer helps students uh, write and anticipates uh, the spelling of different words um, and can help them for, with speech to text. If they're trying to compose an essay, uh, the trying to figure out how to spell something is a huge barrier. It takes up too much working memory and then the student can't show their best. Um, I think uh, also there's things like Snap and Read and all kinds of other um, uh, uh, programs where uh, it will actually read the text to the student, which is great for their classes, especially biology and, you know, uh, social studies and, uh, you know, world history. So that way they can get access to that information. But in English, and um, in, in English class and literacy, um, the students need to read. So in order to read well, um, you have to read. Now, I am a huge advocate if the problem is, if the problem is um, a uh, phonics problem, okay, you have, to, you have to teach them the code. Kids can't learn how to read without learning the code if that's their trouble. If their trouble is a comprehension problem, then you know they're going to require a lot of discussion. You need to talk about the books and use techniques that are research based in order to get them to learn those things better. Um, there are many, many, many uh, programs out there that say that they're going to help kids learn how to read. Um, and what I find is that um, they can be additional or supplemental but they are not going to teach the kid how to read better. That's the teacher's job. And um, we need to make sure that teachers know how to do that well. 
Okay, well, uh, again, that was a pretty big answer. Um, let me just finish up with my last question before we get into the speed geek questions. So sure. um, with the pandemic and, and uh, all of the, the kind of uncertainty and challenges and that sort of thing, we, you know, we have to kind of deal with our students, and especially hopefully as, as things start opening up and as we can get back to some sense of normalcy, how can we help reconnect with our students and make sure that, you know, the mental health challenges that they're dealing with uh, get addressed? Any thoughts on that? I know that's a pretty big question. And it is a big question because that's something I'm still figuring out, to be honest with you. Um, this whole year has been a really difficult year. It's been really hard. And um, there is a point of, I don't want to say over caring, but, um, you know, going going towards this way of, oh, well, they couldn't do it because of this and this and this and this, and giving many, many reasons why um, students aren't able to take care of their responsibilities. But we're in second semester at this point. We're ending the school year. And I think there is a point where students have to be accountable for their learning. Is, is there trauma? You bet. There is trauma. There's trauma. There's upset. There's uncertainty. Uh, people have been sick themselves. People's parents have been sick. All of those things are true. Okay. But I want to say that it's going on, it's going on uh, worldwide, right? And um, I would say if you look at other education systems who have had systematic, you know, trauma going on, like let's just say um, if you were to talk about um, a war torn country, for example, those kids are going through trauma and they're in school. Okay. So I'm not saying that um, you just, you know, be hard nosed and, and completely intolerant of student situations. But I think there is a point where you allow students to, to go too willy nilly for lack of <laughs> better adjective without holding them accountable for their own learning. Okay. Um, you know, one uh, student hadn't done any work. I called every week. Okay. Um, at the beginning last year in March, when the pandemic happened, I was calling every day, but I was calling every day to the students who weren't responding. And I would be on the phone until 6.30, 7.30, 8 at night. And, um, and the, that was extreme, you know? So I think there is a balance. There's a balance of understanding with people's circumstances. And there is a balance of telling people to, okay, yes, this, this, this is terrible for all of us. Let's do our best and see where that is and move on. Now, um, for the psychological aspects, who knows? I mean, um, you know, trauma does get into your body and who knows uh, what, what it will look like? Who knows what will happen to these students, um, how their education will be stagnated or not. But I do believe that we have to hold parents and students accountable for um, putting in their best effort uh, throughout their circumstance, okay? Now, I'm not saying if you are sick with COVID that you should be on your schoolwork. I'm not saying anything crazy like that, but I'm saying that, okay, you're bummed out because you're at home because your parents choose for you to be on virtual. And so you choose not to do any of your assignments and you don't get up, okay? So in that case, okay, we need to work through this so that we can find a better solution than that. Um, that's what I think. It's interesting you brought that up because I, one of the things I wanted to chat with you about is you posted on Twitter a few weeks ago, I think maybe that it says, this is the fourth week of the six weeks. My student messages me, how do I have a zero? And I replied, because you don't attend class yes. and you don't do assignments. <laughs> and then you you ask a question yes. to the Twitterverse, uh, should I edit before pressing send? And I thought there were some great comments that went on uh, behind there. I think yes. it says you posted it on February 4th. And uh, I would definitely recommend following you at MSB Teacher Lady. 
Uh, do you want to talk about that yes. post? I mean, it kind of ties into what you were saying about. Yes. <laughs> Basically, um, I know I know that student um, because I'm a resource teacher. I keep um, students more than one year, and so um, I know that student very well. I know his parents very well. You know, um, I have been reaching out to uh, him, and he hasn't been uh, coming on his Zoom. Not because he, you know, is is you know depressed because his other classes are okay he doesn't want to get up in the morning because it's first period um and i let him know okay so you have to come to class you know don't get catch early senioritis you have to actually attend class to get grades and um and he he's remedied uh uh <laughs> that uh grade since then i think he got a response and um I don't, I'm not sure what he expected me to say, but since then he's been holding himself accountable and, um, and he's able to, you know, fix his situation. One thing you should know is that I do allow students to make up work. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I don't want to seal their fate at, okay, so you messed up and it's over. So I do allow students to, to change their pattern and, um, make up for what they've lost. Well, it was a to me a great use of Twitter. Twitter can get so crazy, um, but I, I thought that was a really nicely um, phrased question. And it, again, it really got I thought some thoughtful responses, which I think makes the world a better place. You know, and again, it improves our profession just to ask a question like that and get uh, some good quality discussion from people. So, well done, well done. Thank you thank you. I think it was helpful to me. Twitter's been very uh, helpful to me in general. Um, I didn't even have an education uh, Twitter account until I got that Fund for Teachers grant. And uh, when they asked, hey, what's your professional social media? I was like, uh oh, I don't have any of that. Um, I better go create some of that. So I <laughs> got on uh, Twitter and started um, Miss B Teacher Lady. And I um, started actually like listening to people and I was amazed. I didn't know that that's what Edu Twitter was. I thought that Twitter was talking about what you ate and taking pictures of your dog or whatever. You know, so I didn't know that um, so much um, understanding comes through um, those small conversations. And I've made a lot of professional relationships and learned a lot it's been the best PD of my entire life, I think. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this time. Let me just ask you a few quick speed geek questions. We'll spin the dial and let's see if we can okay. get this going. <laughs> Again, these are light and lively and fun can be one word answer. We'll go with, we'll try and get three in here. So, okay. Are you a gamer and what's your game? Even Not at all. Words I with think friends the or game I became obsessed. <laughs> I became obsessed with uh, when when it first came out was Super Mario Brothers and <laughs> my gaming. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I think it's still around, isn't it? Uh, I think so, but you know they added this 3D version because I tried to play it with my nope. nephew. And what I find is uh, maybe it's my age, but the games now are so noisy and so um they make <laughs> yeah, you different. feel like your equilibrium is all off it it's difficult for me so i was like okay no i need the old <laughs> school version uh back in the day so i can save the princess <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right so the second one is what's your favorite social network twitter um right. i was on facebook but i haven't um separated my um work friends from my regular friends. And so uh, Twitter is usually um, where I am the most often. I agree, especially for education stuff, so. Definitely. All right, let's go with one more. Let's see what else we've got. Okay, this is probably a little bit bigger, but if you wanna just f focus it in, what's a tech trend you're watching out for? I wouldn't even know. Um, um, I'm on a, I'm on an iPhone seven right now. I should explain that <laughs> uh, uh, my technological prowess is probably a little bit low, but um, but I think that's because of teacher salaries in general. So 
you know, uh, um, I, I, I do my best, but I just keep my ears open, especially on Twitter to see about which applications are, are best for me. The, the one that I liked the most that I used uh, just recently was called YoTeach. And it's not, you know, super new or anything, but it's very helpful to me because I have a hearing impairment. And so Yo Teach kind of puts a back chat on, um, on conversations. So that way students or uh, students can type in their questions for me. So that way I don't have to ask them to repeat themselves quite so many times. It's kind of like today's meet except for teachers. Nice, nice. Well, Alicia, thank you so much. This has really been an enlightening conversation. I've really appreciated it. You really kind of gave me a lot of good food for thought. Um, you're a you're a powerhouse, and I'm really I'm really impressed. And I think I, I, I'm excited to be following you on Twitter. So I hope you keep us all posted on the things you're doing because I, I think you've got uh, some real you've got a spark that I think is going to uh, do well in education. And I can't wait to keep. Uh, learning along with you. I really appreciate it. It's my first interview. So I appreciate you inviting me. You're doing great things. So we'll Thank keep you. in touch. All right. Thank you so much.